Well, good morning. Good morning. I always see if the supernatural is in operation here. Huh? <laughs> this is my lovely wife, Paula. We're getting to know each other. We've only been married for 40 years. Well, 43 in the eyes of the state of Texas, but that's uh, that was my BC days. But, uh, Anything you see in me that's civilized, you can thank us, Paul. We're, uh, we're excited to have Pastor Dan over at Living Hope. I love your pastor's heart. Amen. I try to imagine a picture of Pastor Dan frowning. I can't pull that off. <laughs> I don't think people have that trouble with me, but with Pastor Dan, it's hard for me to imagine. The kid, didn't the kids do, do great? Amen. I felt like I was already in heaven. I felt checking. You know, every tribe, tongue, and kindred was present, worshiping the Lord. I, uh, I just enjoyed it. Uh, by the way, I send thanks from the Ukraine. We were in the Ukraine for about 10 days, about six, seven weeks ago. Wow. And uh, they're, um, the church over there is just amazing. If, if it was up to the government to be taking care of the people in Ukraine, the disaster would be a hundred times worse. But the Church of Jesus Christ, I saw Baptists, Charismatics, Pentecostals, fellowshipping together, breaking bread, serving the communities. These pastors, we went just to try to encourage the pastors. They've been going into these active war zones, uh, delivering food supplies. There's nobody else is going in there. So the church in Poland and the church in Romania have all joined together and there's literally thousands of Christians feet on the ground over there uh, servicing, servicing the soldiers, servicing the communities where no one else would go. So massive amounts of devastation uh, and destruction, it's just heartbreaking. But then I was so encouraged to see the body of Christ in action. I know the NRP, the, that we belong to has uh, is almost is approaching a, a seven-figure contribution to the Ukraine so far. Just got supernatural favor there, and we hope to go back again. We had a prophetic prayer, a prophetic dream. Excuse me. Gosh, like 16 years ago, it was so vivid I wrote it down when uh, when I woke up and I was in a church. I was doing church planning. I was in a building. I saw the sign of the city name and everything on it, and I assumed it was in Russia because we were serving in Russia a lot then. And then when I tried to look it up on the map, I couldn't find it. And later I discovered it was in the Ukraine. And how many know the old Grey Mary and what she used to be? So I'm getting up there in years and I'm thinking, oh, I wonder if that was just, or if that was a prophetic dream, or did I eat pizza before I went to bed? I couldn't remember if it was a, a Holy Spirit or a pizza spirit. But apparently it was a Holy Spirit because uh, we were, God really spoke to us a lot. Uh, as we're transitioning in our ministry, we're going to be traveling over there a lot more. How many people know this war is going to end in Jesus' name? Amen. And when it does, the church is, is, is poised. There, there are churches that used to have 25 to 30 people in them that now have five to 600 people in them. How many people know it? When everything that you're relying on around you begins to disappear or fall apart, that's when you really find out if you know God or not, or if you should know God or not. And uh, can we be honest, that's kind of happening to us too. But yeah. Let's go to the Lord and word of prayer, and then I want to jump in my message. If, you, if you're one of these people that needs a message to have a title, I call mine all in the place of abundance. So Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your heart. We ask you to bless uh, Pastor Dan or PD. I'll be PD too, he can be PD1. PD1. As he's in the pulpit of living hope today, Father, bless them. It can be a blessing to him. Father, we just present our hearts to you. And God, we ask you, speak to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got a Bible, you're probably in the right church. <laughs> now, make sure you're preaching out of the Bible that, you, that Paul used. <laughs> Somebody please tell me that you know that Paul did. No, never mind. Okay. Turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, with me, please. Uh, 
to the person next to you and say, buckle up, cupcake. Okay. Buckle up. Starts off a little rough, but hang in here, it gets better, okay? Hebrews chapter 3, and T. And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. For he is faithful to God who appointed him, just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses, just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths that God would reveal later. By the way, I, I so enjoy worship. It, you know, sometimes when you're in your own church, you're like a designated driver. Everybody else can get drunk in the service but you. <laughs> but I just enjoy God's presence. I really enjoy it. What an awesome worship team you have. Not that I would ever steal a worship team, but you would only have to tie an 8% if you move out to my church. That's all I'm saying about that. <clears throat> but what a, great, what a great representation of excellence. And just to hear guys prophesying on their instruments, I just really enjoy that. Guys are blessed to have them. Uh, so, but Christ is the Son in charge of God's entire house, and we are God's house. If don't you hang me put if in there? We are we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. And it's a big difference between going to church and being the church. And Jesus called us to be the church. I love I love the history and tradition of the church, but I know that Jesus didn't die to start a tradition. He died. He didn't even die to start a religion. He died to restore a relationship between a fallen, sinful man and a loving God creation. And he didn't die that we could have rules and regulations. He died that we could have passion and purpose. That we could find our identity in Christ and be unshakable and immovable. That we would be a contrast in the earth. Verse 7 says, That is why the Holy Spirit says, Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. As Israel did when they rebelled, when they were tested, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw the miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them, and I said, Their hearts turn away from me. Refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. I did warn you about the love, right? Okay, good. That's not, we're not talking about heaven and hell here. We just make that clear. But there's a place of rest in God that unfortunately I meet a lot of believers and I've met a lot of believers over the years that never enter into that place of rest and trust. Honestly, I probably would have never entered into it had I not gone on the mission field and had to have entered into it. Yeah. Uh, poverty tests our commitment, but prosperity tests our character. As a nation, we've passed a lot of tests, like the Great Depression, but our great successes have been the test we've struggled the most to pass. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters, and make sure your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving. Wow, that's pretty harsh. You can't have a secret sense in the church and preach about that. Turning you away from the living God, you must warn each other every day, while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we're faithful to the end, everybody say to the end. Yeah. Trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, then, I'm adding a then, we will share in all things that belong to Christ. Remember what it says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as Israel did when they rebelled. And then he goes on, just in case they're not getting it, he says, and who was it who rebelled against God, even though they heard his voice? Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt, and who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter into his rest? Wasn't it to the people who disobeyed him? 
So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter into his rest. How many people know we live in pretty ridiculous times? You know you're in trouble when, when, when a charismatic pastor believes science more than the government. This is, it's a dangerous time when a pastor has to stand up and say, there's a male and a female. <laughs> and listen to me carefully here. I'm not making fun of people who have gender dysphoria. I can't imagine that kind of trauma in my life. I barely survived adolescence. <laughs> like, straight, okay? So I can't imagine what it would be like that with no foundation, nowhere for you to be able to stand firm and say this is true. The only sin in current society today is to, to not accept and embrace everyone else's ideologies. The problem with that is some ideologies lead to death. I'm not a big socialist, I don't know if you know. I, I've seen firsthand, when we went to Russia, it was right after the fall of the Soviet Union, I have seen how that ends, it never ends well. It seems like every foundational truth of our society is being tested, shaken, questioned. And I don't think that's a coincidence. When people want to move in control, they try to cause as much confusion and disorder as possible because human nature is to crave control in times of crisis. But I have some good news for you. Jesus is not controlled. The Holy Spirit is not contained. And if a thousand people stand up and say something that's not true, it's still not true. It just means there's a thousand people who need Jesus. Uh, we're creatures of grace. We're not, we're not, when, when we were born again, we became part of the second Adam. Jesus was the first of the second Adam, those who were able to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. And God gave us this incredible grace to live a supernatural life. We don't have the right to live a natural life. We can't be just like every other Walmart shop. We can't be afraid of the things that everyone else is afraid of. I so love that last song that they did. Our God is, our God is awesome. Let's just take a minute. Our God is awesome. Amen. Can you remember the day you got saved? Because it says here we need to believe and trust Him as much today as the day we got saved. Do you remember the day? That God opened the eyes of their heart. Yes. And I did. I was schizophrenic. You're still schizophrenic. No, I'm not. Shut up. <laughs> I laugh now. I wasn't laughing then. Because of involvement with drugs and the occult and different things, I, I had more voices in my head than I knew what to do with. And I was very successful. I was a biomedical uh, technician. I worked on life support equipment. That should make you feel good. Uh, next time you're in the hospital, think of me. Uh, but I was tormented. I lived in constant torment. I heard angry voices in my head always telling me that I, I, I would sit on my hands when I was meeting with doctors because I was afraid I was going to slap one of them. I mean, I'm sure you all wanted to slap a doctor at some point, but it's not the right thing to do. I just lived in, in terror. I was drinking excessively. My wife had left me for the third time. Same way, uh -huh. had left me for the third time. Uh, my daughter was gone. Uh, my health was failing. I was, and then I, I, I was sitting one Saturday night in my living room, drinking uh, KB brand vodka. That's the cheapest vodka you can buy in New Orleans, and believe me, there's a lot of vodka in New Orleans. And I was watching movies on Channel 38, I was drinking vodka out of a tea glass. And I dozed off, and when I woke up, the TV was on the Christian channel. So I just about dislocated my shoulder, changing the channel. And then I, when I nodded off again, and it was back on the Christian channel. But the third time that happened, in, Lu in Louisiana, they called it the free zone. I got that loose bump on my back, you know what I'm saying? And I don't know how to describe it because I didn't know God from a Buick, but God, God came to my living room. I didn't see him, but I knew he was there, and I knew he was calling my name. I sensed his awesome holy presence. Hmm. And I looked at the people.
people on the TV. And I said, I don't want to be like those beep, 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 beep people because I think they're phony. I said, but I, I also hate myself. I hate my life. I hate what I've become. And I'm powerless to change. But if you're the guy I've heard you are, he'll take me just like I am. And if you won't, who needs God? Not a real flowery prayer, more like a thief on the cross. But I meant it, and he took me. His invisible hand came into my life. Over the next days and weeks and even months, I just order began to come into my life. I can't tell you how he did it, but he did it. And then eventually he made me go to church. I forgive him for that, but it took a while. I, 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 I was driving to a, this must be for somebody because it's not in my notes, but there's plenty of food and you don't need to worry about Steelers that do anything this year anyway. Right? <laughs> Black and gold. How about those saints? <laughs> oh, the other black I see. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I was I, I I decided I kept really getting convicted by God that He wanted me to go to church. I'm like I don't know. I I I thought I had already been born again. I had dismissed Jesus as being any hope in my life because when I was nine years old, I was in a certain denomination, and when they played just as I am, I came up front, and repeated some words, and they told me that my fire insurance was stamped. And that it was all good, and I got baptized, and after that I was a wet sinner. Because I never knew Jesus, I never had any love for God, I never swore fealty to Him, I never changed anything that I was doing. I mean, I was nine years old. My father was in Vietnam for the first time, uh, and my brother had gone up the night before in tears, and then packed with me, so I went up, because the preacher was an evangelist, and he said, if you die without Jesus, you'll get eaten with worms and the fire won't go out and it'll only be um, fat-free food in the refrigerator and they won't have hot sauce. And I'm like, well, I don't want a piece of that, actually. So, you know. But if you, but if you, if you try our Jesus with poor eyes, please, and bright hearts, then every day will be a holiday and it's free bubble up and you're eating that rainbow stew and you'll be in heaven with God forever. And it's really awesome and they have lots of bacon. Okay, okay, I'm in. <laughs> but I never knew. And so when God told me to go back to church, I had no clue what to do. And so I, I asked my wife to come with me. She was raised Catholic, so I went to a Catholic church. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, I didn't want to look at it. Nobody would talk to us in there. Because we were dressed probably about like we're dressed now, which is a little casual for them. And no one would talk to us, so I just said, well, I'm not going to stay here so much. And I just play hooky the next couple of weeks. And then I hopped in my car and I went in the phone book and I said, well, I guess I'll start with a Baptist church. At least I've been to a Baptist church before. So I, I flipped one over. I found one just on the other side of the ferry in, in, out in St. James Parish, Louisiana. And I got in the car and I started for the place, uh, for the church. And as I turned onto the last street where you catch the ferry, my mind went completely blank. Well, PD, that's not much of a change. Thank you. Yeah. But my mind went blank, and I couldn't remember the name of the church. I couldn't remember where the ferry was. I've been across that ferry for seven years. I couldn't remember anything, so I started cursing, because that was my default response for anything. I said, look at this. Here I am trying to go to church and do the right thing, and a guy can't even get me to the church. What kind of Mickey Mouse outfit is this? So I neglected to tell you that I was on, on the way. I passed this church in the middle of a cane field called Reserve Church, where Pastor Rod Aguilar was the pastor. And when I turned, I literally turned in the parking lot. And it scared me so bad, I thought it must be the devil, so I pulled out of the parking lot and kept going where I started going. Because, let's be honest, we want to do what we want to do, right? Whether God likes it or not. So I turned around and I said, you know, bleep this, I'm going home. And as I turned around, Young black guy stepped out on the side of the road with a Bible in his hand. And a voice very clearly said, pick him up. So I just pulled over and he got in. I didn't know what I called him the holy hitchhiker. I found out, I found out his name was Walter Gaines. Walter and I became friends. And uh, 
And I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to church. And he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going with you. <laughs> and when I said that, Walter said, oh God, I've gotten in a car with a white serial killer. <laughs> and so, of course, you know where we drove back to. We drove back to that same church I pulled in on the way over. Well, now I'm completely freaking out. i got no idea what's going on. And so I walk in, I just start weeping. And I'm like, this is, I finally had, it's finally happened. I finally had, a, I thought one day I'm going to have a nervous breakdown and they're gonna, I'm going to be like one floor of the cuckoo's nest walking around in a bathrobe on Thorazine somewhere. I literally, I thought I was, that was my destiny in life. And there was, of course, it was a charismatic church in the height of charismania. So people in the, in the audience had their guitars and tambourines, and their half-sized turbo cams, and I mean, I thought there were barn yard animals in there. It was like a hull balloon. And they had, I was used to Sister Feel Good and Brother Snores a lot on the keyboard and the piano. <laughs> you know, on the organ and the piano. And then and here they had, they had a, a violin up there. They had a cello, they had drummers, guitar, bass. They had all these instruments and it's booming and there's like 900 people in there. And so I went and sat in the back row with Walter and then Walter just kept scooting down. So he was about six feet away from me because he still thought I was a serial killer. <laughs> and, and I remember grabbing hold of the seats because it felt like I was just going to fly through the ceiling. I guess when you've done a lot of drugs, God turns up the supernatural effect a little bit just to get your attention. <laughs> and I don't remember what Brother Rod preached. He just was a dark-eyed, Cajun guy. You know, has Brother Rod been here? You know, see him. He's the Cajun cannon, we call him. He's great. And um, so, I, so God just kept speaking to me, son, I'm here for you. This is where I am for you. I'm here for you. I still didn't know Jesus was real. I just knew God was telling me. And people ask me, why do you believe in Jesus? Because somebody told you. I said, no, quite the opposite. I wasn't looking for Jesus. I was looking for God. And I found God and found out God was Jesus as an afterthought. And so at the end of it, they, they had a prayer line going up in the front. Of course, I didn't know what that was. But I said, I might as well go up here and talk to this redneck preacher and just let him know I'm going to be here for a while while I get my God thing on. And I'm not taking any crap out of him, and I'm not getting any of my money. But let me just go set him straight. So I got in the prayer line, and I got up to the prayer, and I picked my finger up like this, and I fell on his shoulder, and I cried like a baby uncontrollably. And of course, you know what Christians do then, they start screaming and cheering. <laughs> so now the weirdness just goes up by a factor of two. I'm like, okay, I'm having a nervous breakdown. They're having a party about it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And I just kept hearing this. I'm Jesus. I'm here. I'm Jesus. That's where I want to stay. I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be alive. And yet I'm still alive. So I'm playing with house money. I want to give God all I've got. I know it's not enough, but he's still pleased with it. I'm like that weird thing on your refrigerator that your kid made. You still have no idea what it was. <laughs> but because they did it for you, it, 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 yeah. that's me. <laughs> that's me. Hebrews 3.12 in the Amplified says it this way. Brother, take care of us. Any of you have a wicked heart which refuses to cleave and trust or lie on, leading you to turn away and desert or stand aloof from the living God. Has anybody ever stood aloof from God? I have. You know, sometimes God thinks he's in charge. Can I be honest? He always thinks he's in charge. Now let's be really honest. He is in charge. And he doesn't always do what I want him to do. And he doesn't always do what I want him to do when I want him to do it. But here's the problem. I've learned over these 30, 40 years that he's really smart. And i got to know that if I knew what he knew, I'd be doing the same thing he's doing. Because he's working all things for my good according to his purposes. I didn't say he was working all good things. I didn't say he's even working all things, but he's causing those things to work for my good. You know, if you're a person 
who has a tendency to react to your circumstances. Your life has got to be really crazy right now because our circumstances are like the shifting sand. But I believe what God is telling us in this hour is that we need to respond to Him and not react to our circumstances. Because the answer is never in the circumstances. The answer is always in God. Amen. And He's able to get us where we need to go. How many people know if He could get me in that little church in Missouri, Louisiana, with that redneck preacher who's been my pastor for 38 years, He can get anybody anywhere He wants them to go. In this hour, I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you something. This has been a shaking of the church. It's been a separating of the sheep and the goats. I'm gonna tell you something else. God's not finished with the United States of America. He's not finished. He's not even wrapping things up. God is coming for another great spiritual awakening in this yeah. country. I believe that with all my life. If I didn't, I don't believe God would have ever sent me back here because I wanted to plant churches in North Korea. Have you seen the line to do that? It's really short. <laughs> I met every person who was ministering, real Christians ministering in North Korea. I met them all at one time in one room. And it was about a third of the size of this room. God is coming with harvest. This is a huge opportunity. Anybody know who Chesty Puller is? Any vets in here? Chesty Puller was a Marine. And during the Korean conflict, the press came to him and said, uh, Colonel Puller, do you, write, do you realize that you're surrounded on every side by the enemy? And his response was, outstanding. Now we can attack in every direction. That's my attitude. You talk about a world upside down right now. Never before have more people been questioning truth. Never before have more people been brave enough to come into church. We have new faces coming every Sunday. have no idea who they didn't hear about us sometimes. And they all say the same thing. They come in and it's nothing like what they expected and they sense the presence of God. And because of that, they come back. I'm not stupid enough to think they're coming back for my beautiful face. I have a face for radio. Okay? Not television. <laughs> Psalms 81, 6, 16 says this, and this is God speaking to the church in this hour. Now I will take the load from your shoulders. I will free your hands from their heavy task. You cried to me in trouble, and I saved you. I answered you out of the thundercloud. I tested your faith when there was no water in Meribah. Now he's talking about this victory he's talking about he gave them was when he led them out of Egypt. And he says, you, I tested your faith. They tested God, and God tested them at Meribah. People know when God's testing you, or God has an opportunity for you, it doesn't always look like what you think it'll look like. Pastor, what are some examples of what an opportunity looks like? Uh, watch the news. And that's the only time you'll ever hear me say that. It might look like you got more month than you got money. It might look like you got a bad report from the doctor. It might look like somebody that you really care about offended you. It might look like you're, you lost your job. It might look like it looks like you're in an impossible situation. I have news for you. For most people, that's a bad place to be. But for Christians, that's an invitation to run to the Father. God didn't put that in your life just so you, you could question Him. He put you in that life, in, in that situation so he could demonstrate his power and his sovereignty to you. But guess what? You've got to take your eyes off of everything but him. When we sit at Jesus' feet and ask him, God, work in me both the willing to do your good pleasure. God, create in me, para, the same word you created the universe from. Create in my heart a clean heart. Take from something, from nothing, and make something amazing in my life. God, show me what it is that you want to do through me. Listen to me, O oh people, while I give you stern warnings, O oh Israel. If you would only listen to me, you must never have a foreign God. You must never bow down before a false God. For it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and fill it with good things. 
but no, my people wouldn't listen. Israel did not want me around, so I let them follow their own stubborn desires according to their own ideas. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Listen to what he says after that. Oh, that Israel would follow me walking in my paths. Listen to this. How quickly I would subdue their enemies. Have you noticed that wickedness is going unpunished? It's not the wicked people's fault. Darkness exists at the permission of light. We are the light and the salt. But when the church lives for what the world lives for, there's no contrast. I thank God for churches like this at Pittsburgh that are reaching out, constantly reaching out, constantly reaching out. That's the heart of the Father. God is, God is putting a mark on the heads of believers in this hour who are sighing and moaning and groaning for the revival of God in America, for the restoration of the holiness and of the magnificence and of the honor to God's name. How quickly I would subdue their enemies. How soon my hands would be upon their foes. Those who hate the Lord cringe before him. They will be doomed forever. But I would feed you with the finest wheat and I would satisfy you with my wild honey from the rock. Look at your wife say, wild honey. <laughs> oh, you don't have to, I would. <laughs> wild honey. <laughs> Oh, I gotta preach. Let me just stay focused here. I would feed you with the finest wheat, and I would satisfy you with the rock. While our four hundred one ks are dissolving, while our interest rates are crashing, while our money is ridiculously overinflated, while our borders are wide open, while, while crime is on the rise, while crime goes unpunished, while corruption is rampant in government, watch out! God is on the move. But watch out that in the midst of this. You don't become so overwhelmed by everything that's going around you that you take your eyes off of God and kind of begin to cool off and move back. Well, maybe I'd better buy some bullets and salt pork. How many bullets are you going to buy? How many people are you willing to kill for a waffle? God is our only hope, and He's always been our only hope. Thank God for the disruption that was President Trump, but President Trump is not the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. Jesus is our only hope. And revival is our only hope. And God is coming. Listen, Roe versus Wade is no longer the law of the land in the United States of America. Somebody clap their hands. And other abortions still in the United States. That's not the point. The point, there's a big, when a, when a government puts its seal of approval on the murder of innocent blood, there's a curse on the land. That curse was broken by the Supreme Court. God is moving. Turn off the news. If you, well, if I don't watch the news, I'm uninformed. Yeah, but if you do, you're misinformed. I'd rather be uninformed than misinformed. Because by the way, I, I, I don't retract the Daniel fast where I didn't watch the news. The world continued to spin without me watching it. Alright. This is my first closing. Pastor God, aren't you going to the good part? Wait, that was the good part. No, I'm kidding. Now we're going to the good part. That was the introduction. Don't panic. I'll have you out of here in 20 minutes and 13 seconds. All my top A personalities are setting the timers down. Mark chapter 30, verse 44 in the NLT. The apostles returned to Jesus for their ministry to her and told them all that they had done and taught. And Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest for a while. And he said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. It was like there was a long-winded guest preacher. You know? so, so they left the boat for a quiet place where they could be alone, but many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran along the shore and got ahead of them. And Jesus saw the crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he just began to preach and teach again. They, they, they just wanted to go get a Big Mac and chill for a while. They'd been ministering all day. And yet when Jesus saw them, he was moved with compassion. And late that afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to nearby farms and villages and find something 
That's a pretty good idea, right? And then Jesus messes everything up. He says, you feed it. And all the disciples, the faithful ones, the ones who had seen the miracles of Jesus, the blind eyes open. Ah, ah. I ain't got no money. Obey me. This is a Christian. This is called a carnal Christian flip phone. <laughs> Do I have enough money to feed these people? No. Sorry, Jesus. Can't help you. It's okay when you're asking Jesus for miracles, right? Because you're the recipient of the miracle. But what about when he wants you to be the person, the miracle for somebody else? Because eventually you can place demands on the anointing. You can place demands on the promises of God. But just know this, eventually they're going to place a demand on you. They're going to take you out of your comfort zone. That trip to, the, to, to, to uh, Ukraine, I wasn't afraid. I'm not smart enough to be afraid. But I, I'm an old guy who don't like riding around in cars for 16 hours a day. We were driving constantly, going through roadblocks and checkpoints and stuff. But I had joy in it because I knew this where God wanted me to be. Jesus said, you feed them. And, he, and, the, and the disciples said, but why? We, we, we have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food from these people. Be careful that when everything that we've trusted and believed in is falling apart around us, that we don't feel like we can't do anything because the world is not cooperating. To say that we can't have revival because there are sinners is to say we can't have fire because there's too much wood. We have an excellent opportunity to attack Satan in every direction. Every direction. The King James calls this, uh, if you had, they said if we had so many denarii, 200 denarii, I think they said, we couldn't feed all these people. The denarii represented a day's labor. If we had 200 days worth of labor, of course, now you don't even have that. If the IRS gets about 180 days of labor, you get about 220. <laughs> he said, well, how much bread do you have? What do you have? He asked. And apparently, they all went like this. Because he said, go find out. See, God's not asking us to have all the answers. He's asking us to be open to him using us. It doesn't really matter what I have. Have I presented what I have completely to Jesus? Have I surrendered what I have to him? If I have, he's going to take whatever I gave him and he's going to work a miracle with it. Whatever it is. So they came back and reported. And by the way, they got, they got these uh, five loaves and two fish from a kid. I think let's just take a moment to celebrate that kid's mom who packed him a lunch that day. <laughs> He's the only one there that had a lunch. You know, you can just see his mother. You're going to take some food with you. Yeah. <laughs> I could eat. I could eat, mom. They came back and reported we have five loaves and two pots of bread and two fish. And then the Jesus told the disciples, have the people sit down in groups green grass. And so they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. And Jesus took the five loaves and two fish and looked up to heaven and blessed them. And breaking those loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. And he divided the fish for everyone to share. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. Wow. Wow. There was never any question who was going to feed those people. Never. Like, Jesus is not stupid. When he said, what do you have? It wasn't because he, he thought they were going to, oh, well, I got a, I, fortunately I have a, a tractor trigger with a ramen back here. That, no, he knew they didn't have anything. He'd been with them. He knew they were hungry. And the disciples' solution was, send them away. Send them away. These people, they come in, they, they, they're smoking out in front of the church, and they, they, sometimes they curse, and they, 
they, they're dressed funny and they got these tattoos and some of them are wearing dress. I don't know what's going on with these people. Just get them out of here so we can have a nice quiet church service and just relax. And Jesus won't have any of it. He won't have any of it. All you weird people say, thank God he loves weird people. Well, there's three of us, four, five, six, and then there's the rest of you liars. I don't know if you have, you play the keyboard at the close of the service, or is that what you do? If you like to ask the brother to come up. What, what value do we place on a human soul? In this hour, when things are so desperate, you're either going to be making decisions that lead to the cross or the bank. And I'm not asking you not to be practical and good stewards of your belonging. I absolutely think we need to do that. You can't help people if you're broke. Right. But in this hour, I think God is going to call us and ask us, are you all in? Are you believing? You know, remember Jesus said, you can't love God and mammon. Well, mammon doesn't mean money. Money is a good personification of mammon, but if you look at the etymology of that word, it's an ancient Chaldean word that means confidence. It's even worse than money, in other words. It's where does your confidence lie? Are you trusting me, or are you trusting me? the world around. Well, you'd have to be, I don't know if I put this sweetly, I don't have enough crayons or time to explain it to you if you think there's anything in the world that can save us now. Jesus was always our only hope. It's never been any question what needed to happen in the Church of America. There's never been any question what needs to happen in America now. People need to repent of their sin and accept the Lordship of Christ. And I'm telling you, God is ready to send people into your church, your church, this church, by the hundreds. He wants to do that. And he's, and, and he's waiting for you to say, God, send them. God, we need them here. God, send them. I remember what it's like to be an alcoholic. I remember what it's like to lose your family. I remember what it's like to be mentally tormented. I remember what it's like to have a pistol in my mouth thinking I couldn't go on like this anymore. I remember that. And then Jesus came. And I'm glad that he saved me. And I'm glad that, that he saved my wife and he restored my marriage. God's got a lot of kids that are still on the street. And they're struggling. They're struggling with the kind of things we've never even had to think about. And they're having to struggle with them every day. He's saying, son, daughter, will you please help me with the rest of my children? You know, I can tell you this, 65, I got two kids, and it doesn't matter if I hit the lottery three days in a row. If my kids aren't doing well, life's not that good. Can you say amen? If somebody you love and you care about is in a bad place, life's hard. It's hard. I'm just so glad this is all we have to live for. I'm so glad that this is practice for eternity. Aren't you? Aren't you? When we tell Jesus, you can do it, God. You can send revival. You can pull people off the street and save them by the God, you can do the miraculous. Nothing is impossible for you. You said that if we would go and tell people about the gospel, if we would seek first the kingdom of God, that anything we needed, we wouldn't have to chase it down like the average Walmart chopper. You would cause whatever we needed to pursue us. And I can promise you, after my years of service in the Lord, that is absolutely true. I have made some of the stupidest financial decisions you can ever imagine. I have left jobs that other people would kill for and I have no regrets. God has met every need in our life. And I have people all over the world that I call brother and sister that I love dearly and that I look forward to seeing, and if not in this life, in the next. 
God wants to send a revival. And I'm going to tell you what he wants to send a revival to. It has nothing to do with your building. Although you've got a gorgeous building. It has to do with your heart. And I know what kind of heart you have because I know Pastor Dan's heart. Pastor Dan loves people. He loves souls. He cares about souls. I don't roll that bus out and do outreaches with just any church. I only, I only roll that. It costs money to do that. And it takes people's lives and time. But I do it here anytime he asks me because I see his heart. And when I see his heart, I see the Father's heart. And when I see the Father's heart, I want to meet the Father's need, his desire. Amen? Amen. So what value do we place on revival and what value do we place on soul? And I say they're priceless. I say they're priceless. Again, I want to say how much we love and appreciate you for allowing your pastor to be out and also for sitting, putting up with me for 45 minutes. Somebody's going to correct me in like 46 minutes, 12 seconds. <laughs> we'll give me five more minutes. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Okay, I got another 30 minutes. No, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I want to thank you again for allowing your pastor to us. I'm, I'm so excited for him to be able to download his work <coughs> to our people. And I look forward to doing another outreach with you guys again soon. Let's stand our feet together. Why do we say that, stand to our feet? What else would you stand to your elbows, please? <laughs> Tradition. If you're here for the first time, you've heard the gospel of Jesus presented as anything other than church membership, and you'd like to rectify this situation. I bet you anybody in these first three rows over here could explain the gospel to you in great detail. and could share with you the miraculous things Jesus has done in their life. And it doesn't require church membership. I tell you what I tell our people every week. we got plenty of dysfunctional people. We're not short of those, so it's not like we're trying to recruit that. But we don't want you to leave. You don't understand how much God loves you and how incredible His purpose for your life could be. So, if you need to get Jesus in your heart or in your life or you need someone to pray for you, any of these folks around you would be glad to pray for you. Amen? Amen. But we love you and we appreciate you and I thank you so much for the honor of being here. I thank Pastor Dan or PD1 as he will now be referred to. I didn't know if you called him PD. So I'm learning something every day. Again, thank you guys so much. We love you. Please be Jesus for somebody this week and take your loaves and fishes and present them to the Lord and watch what he does with your life. Amen? Amen.